For our scripture reading today, we will be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. You can find that on the page 964 in the Pew Bible. Second Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 7. To the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the wall of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any afflictions, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for our your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Happy Pentecost Sunday. One person cares about Pentecost. Chris Johns, thank you for that. We don't make a huge deal about Pentecost uh, at Calvary, but when you think about the story of the Bible altogether, the, the culmination really of Christ's work, it, it's moving towards Pentecost because he dies on the cross, he rises from the dead, he ascends so that he can send the Spirit down into God's people the re-inspiring of the people of God. So Pentecost is a big deal, um, and uh, it's good to be here with you on Pentecost. But that's not what the sermon is about this morning. The sermon uh, is the beginning of our sermon series on 2 Corinthians, and we've entitled it Unshakable Hope. And Lord willing, we're going to be spending the next six months or so working our way through Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, and uh, we don't really have a hard stop in our preaching schedule until we get to missions month. So if we haven't finished by missions month in November, that's fine. We'll just take a break, do missions month, do Advent, and we'll pick up what's left of 2 Corinthians after the first of the year. So I'm not sure exactly when we'll be done, but when we get to chapter 13, verse 14, which is the end of 2 Corinthians, then you'll know that we are done. So you can kind of follow along, keep track of our progress like that. Here at Calvary, about half the times uh, our sermons are topical in nature. So whether that's connected to the church calendar or the church season like Advent or Lent. Other times it's uh, particular issues that are going on uh, in the culture or things that are going on in the life of the church that we think are, it's important uh, to touch base on. And then the other half of the time we work our way through a book of the Bible. And um, the upside of the topical sermon series approach is that it allows us to focus on themes that are particularly relevant for where we are as a church. So that can be super helpful. So like last month, we had our Essential Church sermon series responding to and giving direction in light uh, of, of the, uh, the COVID pandemic and people uh, disengaging with church or taking time out during the election to focus on politics. These sorts of things can be helpful for given the moments that the church finds itself. But the dangers of always staying with topical sermon series is that we can start to pick and choose. Really, I'm the one that picks and choose. You don't pick and choose. But I can start to pick and choose the portions of Scripture that are the most comfortable or the most easy, or that kind of resonate with what I want to talk about, my own hobby horses. And it allows for the preacher and for churches to sort of skirt around the passages of Scripture or the parts of Scripture that don't resonate as easily. But when you work through a book of the Bible, you have to take the whole book as it stands. And so then you're forced to deal with all aspects of God's Word. And 
So here we are this morning in 2 Corinthians. We're going to work our way through uh, the entire book. We're going to do our best to submit to all that God reveals to us throughout this book of 2 Corinthians, the parts that comfort us and the parts that challenge us. As I mentioned, the title for this series is Unshakable Hope, but as I was working my way through the book again and sort of really trying to dig into all the themes of it, I began to wonder if that maybe wasn't the best title. So I might be changing it, so don't get it too attached to that title. I think it works now. It's serviceable, but you know, we, might, we might be changing it later. But this morning, we're going to be looking at the first five verses. I had told Chris we were going to do all seven, but as I wrote the sermon, I got through the first five and felt like that was going to be enough for us. So we're going to look at the first five verses of 2 Corinthians. And in these first five b- verses, Paul gives us three truths about God's comfort in the light of our afflictions. So we're going to take each truth in turn, and then we're going to end with a fourth bonus truth that we'll look at as we come to the Lord's table and take communion together. So let me, at the beginning here of our sermon series, let me just say a few words about 1 Corinthians, about when it was written, who was written, all these sorts of details, and then we'll move into our text and sermon proper. So the opening verses, verse 1, you can look at it, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So as to who wrote it, the apostle Paul wrote uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. He says, though, that he wrote it along with Timothy, Paul, of course, is the more famous of the two and was uh, Timothy's mentor. But Paul and Timothy are penning this letter together, and they're writing it to the church that is at Corinth. And Corinth, in the ancient times, was located in the same place that it's located today. So it's a uh, seaport town in Greece, and it was uh, colonized or recolonized uh, by the the Roman Empire. And uh, it was known throughout uh, the Greek and Mediterranean world. It had a reputation for being sort of spicy. So a bit of how we Americans think about Las Vegas, this is how the ancient world thought about Corinth. It was pretty rife with lots of unseemly stuff. And so Paul... And Timothy landed in Corinth. We can read about it in Acts chapter 18. And they landed in Corinth and they planted a church there. And they were there for about a year and a half, which is a bit longer than Paul typically would stay in many of the towns in which he would go to and preach the gospel. But he was there for a year and a half and he really helped to establish the church. So he wasn't just the evangelist that blew through. He was the founding pastor of this church here in Corinth. And he wrote two letters. Actually, he wrote four letters. We have two of the letters. So the two letters we have are 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And uh, from the beginning, uh, as when Paul would le- when Paul left the church, he would write back to the church with still kind of carrying that pastoral burden. He would write back to the church things that he wanted them to know and to to do. And in First Corinthians, the first letter he wrote, we can read that Corinth, the church in Corinth, just like the city of Corinth, was a bit of a hot mess, and it was the church was rife with sexual immorality lawsuits among the church members. There was confusion about the function and purpose of marriage. There were factions within the church, kind of uh, different loyalties uh, that people were following, different apostles. There was a preoccupation with supernatural Holy Spirit sign gifts. So maybe some of you didn't even hear about Pentecost before the Sunday. They really believed in Pentecost in Corinth. And so they were all about the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, and they were about prophesying and uh, miracles and healings. And it had gotten a bit out of hand, and so Paul had to write to talk to them about that. There was a disregard for the poor within the church of Corinth, and then that led to a sacrilege of the Lord's Supper. So there was a lot of things, a lot of issues that Paul was tackling in 1 Corinthians. But things seem to have settled down a bit by the time we get to Paul's letter to the second, to the second letter to the Corinthians. Or at least he's not flagging any of those same issues. So hopefully there's been some progress made. But there's a number of newer issues that have emerged that are occupying Paul's attention, and there's the occasion for why he writes. Now, first, very practically, and this wasn't so much an issue, but 
an occasion for his letter is he's going to be taking a collection for poor that are in Jerusalem. And the church in Corinth has agreed to participate in this collection. And so he wants to prepare them so that they're ready when he shows up to gather the money. And so he talks about it in chapter 8. But he doesn't get to this collection thing this, until all the way to chapter 8. And if that was the only reason he was writing, we would have a much shorter letter than we do here in 2 Corinthians. He actually has some other issues that he wants to address. And so one of these main issues, and actually these other two issues are kind of related, because one of these main issues is that after Paul and Timothy left, some other ministers of the gospel, some other apostles came in and were carrying on the work that Paul and Timothy had started. And Paul refers to them as the super apostles, which I get that a lot, and myself as super pastor. Uh, but no, actually, that's not true. And in fact, we wouldn't want to be called super apostles because Paul is not intending that as a compliment. These super apostles that come along behind Paul are casting aspersions on Paul and Timothy's ministry. Whereas Paul was scrappy and passionate, the super apostles were eloquent, they were sophisticated, they were wealthy, and they generally managed to keep their robes clean. And whereas Paul's ministry was marked by troubles and persecutions, if you just go back and read through the, this, the account of Acts and Paul's ministry, he's constantly running into trouble and getting driven out of town and getting bloodied and beaten up and whipped and shipwrecked and on and on it goes. And we're going to read about more of that here in 2 Corinthians. But Paul's ministry was marked by troubles and persecutions. The ministry of the super apostles was marked by success. And so the Corinthians are becoming enamored by the slick ministry of the super apostles. And they're beginning to look down on Paul. Now, Paul is not, I think, primarily concerned about his own personal loss of respect, where he's just this insecure apostle who needs everyone to tell him that he's doing a great job, and he's a little jealous about these super apostles that are cutting in on his territory. That's really not what's going on. The fact is that as the Corinthians are starting to look down on Paul and up to the super apostles, Paul is seeing that their understanding of the gospel priorities are beginning to get out of skew. And this is what leads to Paul's real reason for writing. Because the Corinthians have developed, maybe they've always had, but it's manifesting itself now. They have developed an unhealthy theology of glory. And for them, following Christ means victory and success, not defeat and suffering. And they've become so fixated on joining with Christ in his resurrection power, which is why they were so into the sign gifts and Pentecost and the Holy Spirit that they've lost sight of joining with Christ in his suffering and in his death. And the Corinthians, quite possibly, are the earliest expression of the prosperity gospel. So if that's a term that maybe is familiar to many of us, but the prosperity gospel is a form of gospel ministry and church that so emphasizes the prosperity that the gospel brings in a way that minimizes and hides or denies the suffering and affliction that the gospel brings. And the gospel does bring prosperity. The gospel brings resurrection power. The gospel brings new life, right? The gospel brings healing. But the gospel also invites us into dying with Christ. And the Corinthians were really emphasizing the prosperity power of the gospel and were undermining or ignoring the affliction and the suffering aspect of the gospel. And so Paul is writing to correct them about their understanding of the gospel and to give them a truly Christian account of the relationship between suffering and glory, between God's comfort and Christ's afflictions. And so all of what Paul is going to say in the chapters to come is going to be drawn from his own ministry experience and from what he has learned and seen in the ministry experience of Jesus. And Paul has learned that the truest mark of apostleship is not glory and success like the super apostles, but suffering and affliction. Because it's when we enter into Christ's suffering 
and into his death that we enter into Christ's comfort and his life. So that brings us then to Paul's opening remarks in verses 3 and 4 and to the first truth that our text gives us about God's comfort in the light of our affliction. So look back here in our text. Uh, verses 3 and 4. I'll read them again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So this theme of comfort makes an immediate appearance in Paul's letter to the second Corinthians. Backing up into verse 2, we can see that Paul writes, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So just in these first couple verses, we have the God, that God is a God of grace. He's a God of peace. He's the Father of mercies, or sometimes that term is translated compassion. And he is the God of all comfort. So Paul is going to be talking at length throughout this letter, reminding the Corinthians that the gospel includes suffering and affliction. But that's not where Paul starts. It's not the first thing that rolls off of his pen. He starts with the compassion and the comfort of God. I think that's a good place for us to start, too, as we move into this book of 2 Corinthians and its emphasis at times on suffering. As the cultural winds begin to or continue to shift around us, I think sometimes we can begin to lose sight of God as the source of mercy and of grace and of peace and comfort. And we can begin to think of God as primarily a complicating factor in our lives that disturbs our comfort and our peace. I was discussing the sermon text with Pastor John earlier this week, which, by the way, Pastor John and Jamie, they had uh, their baby, baby Charlotte, uh, this past week. So make sure you uh, pass that along. Perhaps they are watching even now uh, in our live stream. And uh, if they watched in the live stream in the first service, no one clapped when I announced that, but hopefully they saw that you all clapped in the second service and uh, that you really care about them. So there you go. Um, <laughs> In any case, I was talking with Pastor John about this sermon and kind of where it might go at the beginning of the week, and he mentioned how a number of students that he interacts with, he feels like they can tend to think of God primarily as an inconvenience, as an unwelcome hitchhiker on the highway of life, a sort of killjoy that complicates the high school journey. I think that can be true for even us as adults. It's as though we think we're just happily cruising along life's highway, riding it all night long as the song goes. And then we pick up Jesus as a hitchhiker on the side of the road and suddenly the happy times are over. Suddenly it's no more top down, radio up, wind in the hair, good time. Now we've got Jesus in the car. We've got to turn the radio down. We've got to put it on K-Love. Because it's, it's the only station he listens to. And we've got to start scowling at everyone for driving too fast. And so now we have to have a traditional view of sex and marriage. And we have to believe in judgment and hell. And what was a joy ride becomes a joyless road trip with stern Uncle Jesus driving the speed limit in the left-hand lane to teach everyone around us a lesson. And the idea of God as a source of comfort and peace and blessing seems anything but. But Paul's opening comments remind us that God in Christ is not the awkward hitchhiker who complicates our ride down life's highway. To the extent that we are riding down life's highway, he is the good Samaritan who comes to us when we've been waylaid on life's highway. He is the God of grace and peace and the Father of mercies. And he is the God of all comfort. And the point I want to make here is that in light of all that Paul will say in the chapters to come, 
about the necessity of sharing in Christ's suffering, Paul's primary concern as he starts his letter is not to assert right out of the gate that we need to suffer with God or suffer with Christ, but to assert God's comfort and kindness. I said recently in a sermon that we have to begin by receiving God's accepting love before we will be able to make use or benefit from his perfecting love. I think that's the same basic idea that is animating Paul's comments here. Our vision of God must start with his comfort and his mercy. Before we consider a life of sacrificial obedience as we follow his his ethics and his rules. So as you think about God, how do you think about God? Do you think of him primarily as a complicating and somewhat inconvenient factor in your life? Someone to whom your allegiance will cost you. Or do you think about God primarily as your heavenly father who is full of grace and peace and mercy and compassion who wants to bless you? Students, you're here this morning. How do you think about God? How do you think about God as a middle school student or a high school student? You know how the cultural winds blow in your schools and on your campus. Maybe it's the true as well for college students. Do you think about God as a refuge and an ally? Or do you think about God as an inconvenience? Listen, he loves you. He loves you eternally. And he is for you. In the same way that a parent desires with all their heart to see their children flourish and to enter into happiness and wholeness. God desires to see us flourish and to enter into happiness and wholeness. And his love for us is steady and deep. And he is full of compassion and mercy. And he longs to give us comfort. So set aside all the other thoughts that you might have about what you think God might want from you or for you or expect of you or will ask of you. Set those aside for now and just start with the truth that he loves you, that he is the God of all comfort. Because if we don't start with God's love for us, then we never will start. So the first truth that we need to come to terms with as we consider God comfort and affliction is that God is a God of comfort. And that is an important truth an important place to start because the second truth is this, this God of comfort does call us into paths of affliction. In verse four, look back here in verse four, God speaks of this father of all mercy, this God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Throughout 2 Corinthians, when Paul uses the language of us and we, he does not mean, most of the time, us Christians. So he's not writing to the Corinthians and saying, hey, when we, you know, me and you and us Christians, like when we're all having a hard time, this is what's true about God. When he's using the language of us and we, he's using it in an apostolic sense. And what he means by us and we is Timothy and I. Those of us who have labored on your behalf in a pastoral capacity, in an apostolic way, you refers to the Corinthians. So when Paul says in verse 4 that God comforts us in all of our afflictions, he's referring to the afflictions of Paul and Timothy. And specifically, the afflictions that have come to Paul and Timothy because of their apostolic ministry. In other words, Paul isn't here talking about our mutual respective afflictions that we all share, like getting cancer or losing our jobs or having difficult children or whatever it might be, or the random afflictions that happen to everyone. He's talking about the afflictions that have befallen 
the ministers of the gospel, himself and Timothy, because of their participation in gospel ministry. And we can see this all throughout his letter. I mean, we have to kind of read ahead to recognize this is the point of what Paul is doing here in the us and you. But we can see it in verse 8 in particular. So just look a little bit down into next week's text. Paul says, For we, Timothy and I, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. And he goes on to talk about how God met them in that. But when Paul uses the us and we language, he's talking about the ministry difficulties, or when he uses the language of affliction here in verse 4, he's talking about the affliction that he and Timothy have experienced as ministers of the gospel. So while it's certainly true that God is the God of all comfort, Paul acknowledges with his own life that God who is the God of comfort, calls each of us in our own way to sacrificial obedience. The Corinthians had developed a view of God's calling that left no room for suffering and affliction for the cause of Christ. Now, it's wrong to think of God primarily as a moralist whose chief goal for our lives is to call us into paths of sacrificial obedience just to put us at odds with the culture around us. But it is true that following Christ's call does come with a cost. Not all the time and not in every direction, but if we have a vision of Christianity that never asks us to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus, then we don't have a true and accurate vision of Christianity. We're not called to pick up Jesus's cross. Only Jesus is called to pick up Jesus's cross. And we're not called to pick up even Paul's cross. Paul's cross was for Paul. You have your cross. I have my cross. Each of us has our own cross. We aren't called to pick up everyone else's cross. We're called to pick up our own. And it's not always easy to know exactly what what all that will look like. But inevitably, what it means to follow the call of Christ is that we're each going to have to pick up our own cross and that there is going to be some element of dying to self that is going to be required of us as we step into our life with Christ. A while back in my politics sermon series uh, back in 2020, I talked about Christianity's conservative dying with Christ virtues and Christianity's liberal rising with Christ virtues. And I made the point that both sets of virtues are needed to reflect the fullness of the gospel. And there are some cultural and social settings that make the dying with Christ virtues very comfortable and easy. And there are other cultural and social settings that make the rising with Christ virtues very comfortable and easy. So depending on the social context in which you happen to be living in at any given moment, you might find that it doesn't cost you very much to adhere to one side of the Christian polarity. But adherence to both sides, that will invariably cost us something. And some of you are rooted in socially and culturally conservative environments and living out the liberal rising with Christ virtues, it's very costly for you. And others of you, perhaps most of us living here in Oak Park or students in your schools, you have the opposite challenge. And living out the conservative dying with Christ virtues will cost you something. And so it's important at the outset to ask ourselves this question. Does our faith have a category for affliction? Some of us perhaps have gotten so good at playing both sides of the Christian virtue polarity that we are mostly able to skate past any affliction. When I'm with my progressive friends, I emphasize the Christian virtues on the left and I go quiet 
about the Christian virtues on the right. And when I'm with my conservative friends, I emphasize the Christian virtues on the right, and I go quiet about the Christian virtues on the left. My point this morning, and Paul's point to the Corinthians, is not that every moment of our lives has to be a moment of suffering for the cause of Christ. That certainly was not true of Paul. That wasn't even true of Jesus. But the important point to make here at the outset of 2 Corinthians is that following the calling of Christ does come with some measure of affliction at some point. So here's an honest question in search of an honest answer. Is the comfort that you have in Christ worth the cost of affliction that invariably comes with it? Some of us just simply need to answer an honest no. It's not. We have not experienced Christ's comfort in a way that offsets the affliction that would come with it. And so we just tap out of the affliction. And better to give the wrong but honest answer than a correct but dishonest answer. But of course, I would rather you give a correct and honest answer. Because the truth of the matter is that Christ and his comfort is worth it. The comfort we receive from the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort far outweighs, Paul will tell us later in chapter 4, verse 16, the inevitable affliction that comes with following Christ. So he is worth it, and he does give sufficient comfort. And that leads to our third truth. The comfort of God comes to us in our affliction. Listen again to verses 4 and 5. This Father of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And I'm especially struck here by how Paul says that God's comfort comes to us in our affliction. And how in verse 5, it's as we share in Christ's suffering that we come to share in Christ's comfort too. And this is the great paradox of the Christian faith, that God's, com that God's comfort to us in Christ comes to us in the midst of our participation in Christ's affliction. Sometimes I think we can have it in mind like we're... we're we're in God's army and he sends us out and we go to the front lines to follow the will of Christ and we suffer affliction on the front lines and then we, we, we get all bloodied and beaten up and then we retreat back behind the front lines to the hospital tent where we receive the comfort and the care of Christ and he binds us up and then he sends us back out into the affliction. But that's actually not it. That's not how it works. It's not that we have to retreat out of the affliction in order to find comfort. God's comfort is there for us in the affliction. We find God's comfort at the front in the battle, not after the affliction when we retreat, but in the affliction while we are hearkening to Christ's call. And this is true of all suffering. And it's no less true of the kind of suffering that we suffer specifically for the cause of Christ. So all kinds of suffering is the exact place that we experience the comfort and the care of the Father of all mercies. If you've walked with Christ through any shadowed valley of suffering, you know that the comfort of Christ is not just waiting for you on the far side of the valley but it's waiting for you in the valley. Last week, we were doing our service of lament, and Pastor Johnny shared from us briefly with Psalm 23 and how we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But it's in the valley of the shadow of death that we meet the comfort of the shepherd. That's where we are comforted. The comfort doesn't wait for us on the other side of the valley of the shadow of death, nor does it wait for us behind us. 
We meet the comfort of Jesus in the valley. And that's how it always is with suffering. God does not leave us to our own devices as we embark on the path of difficult obedience. We enter into Christ's comfort as we enter into affliction for his sake. And I think this is such an important point for us to understand as we think about Christ's call on our lives and as we move into this whole study of this theme of Christ's comfort and affliction. I used to vaguely think that what it meant to follow Christ was to follow Christ's directions, his will, his path, but that that was always something a bit different than following him. I had this vision of Christ standing next to me there at the precipice of the valley, looking down into the valley. There we are looking down in it together. And Jesus stands next to me, pointing to the objective on the other side, says, go over there, walk that path, do that hard thing. And I never doubted that he had my best interest in mind. And I never doubted that there was truly some blessing on the other side of that difficult path. But I didn't have a picture of him in my mind of him walking down into the valley with me. But you see how insufficient that vision was. Because Jesus doesn't just point us towards our objective. He walks with us toward our objective. Indeed, he himself is both the objective and the path to the objective. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way to the truth and life that is himself. As we walk towards him, we walk on the path that is him and therefore, he is always with us when we are on the path through the valley. When I thought I had to walk the path alone, it just got to be too much for me. And no matter how great the prize was that was waiting at the end of the path, I just couldn't do it. And it is too much if we have to walk the path alone. But we're not alone. We're not alone. Jesus never points us towards a path that he doesn't walk down with us. And it's as we step into the costly path of obedience with Jesus that we experience his comfort and his presence. So listen to me, perhaps especially you students, but all of you. Jesus is calling all of us to a particular way of life that will at times lead us into the shadowed valley. Not every path goes through the shadowed valley. Thank God. But there are times where to get to where we need to go to where it, we will find our greatest joy. The only way to get there is through the shadowed valley. So there will be times we have to walk through the shadowed valley and that shadowed valley will be costly and it doesn't cost all of us the same amount. But it does cost all of us more than we have to spend. And it can be and it will be scary. But listen, he loves you. He loves us. And he will walk with us. And as we walk with him, we will know his eternal comfort and his peace and his mercies. And the world just can't give us that. The world can give us an echo of that for a brief season. But true, lasting, soul-quenching comfort comes to us only in Christ. And he's not calling us to hard paths just because. He's calling us to hard paths because he loves us. And he knows what's best for us. And he knows what will bring us the greatest joy. And he knows that it's hard and he knows that it's scary. And that's why he's offering to walk with us. He doesn't stand next to you pointing to the path. He stands next to you with his arm around your shoulders saying, let's walk this path together. So you don't need to be afraid. He is with you every step of the way.
And if you stumble and fall or get knocked down, he is there to pick you up and to brush you off, to bind up the wound and to help you keep going. And if it all gets to be too much, he is wise enough to know when you just need a break and to let you catch your breath. So is there a place in your life, perhaps it's your whole life, perhaps you're not a Christian and you You've never surrendered your life to Christ. But perhaps you're a Christian and there's just a particular area that you are refraining from surrendering to Christ. It's a shadowed valley path that you don't want to walk, where Jesus is inviting you to follow him, where he's inviting you to pick up your cross and to follow him as he picks up his cross and follows his heavenly father. Don't run from the affliction that comes with Christ's calling, lest you find yourself running from the comfort that comes from Christ's calling. And that brings us to the Lord's table and communion and our fourth bonus point about comfort and affliction. And it's this point. Christ is still afflicted. In Colossians 1.24, in a passage that is very, very parallel or very similar in wording to our text here, Paul speaks of how he, Paul, is filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, the church. And it's an interesting passage. A lot of commentators write about it. What does it mean that Christ is still lacking afflictions? Hebrews 7.27 tells us that Christ suffered once for all, for all sins. Unlike the Old Testament sacrifices, which had to be offered over and over and over again because they couldn't atone, Jesus suffered once. His one sacrifice was sufficient to cover all sins. His one act of atonement made eternal peace between us and God. So in that sense, the afflictions of Christ with respect to the penalty of sin are over. But the power and presence of sin has not been wholly eradicated. We know this to be true in our own lives. We look at our own lives and who among us can say that once we came to Christ for salvation, we never sinned again. Not me, not you. And when we zoom back and we look at the church, both Calvary and then globally, right, there is still sanctifying work that needs to be done within the body of Christ, the people of God. And Paul is saying in Colossians that because of that reality, there is some sense in which Christ is still suffering in his body, the church. The church's suffering is his own. And parents, isn't this how it is for those of you who are parents? There is cost and affliction that comes with bringing up your children in the world to bringing your own flesh and blood, your own body, as it were, into a place of maturity. Good parents do not parent from a place of safety and remove. They enter into their children's pain and their suffering and their affliction. And the affliction of the children become their own affliction. And so this is why Paul will say later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that He faces daily the pressures of his care and anxiety for the churches. Who is weak, he writes, and I am not weak. Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant. Paul feels the affliction in his own self of those that he is caring for. And same is true for Jesus with the whole church, which is to say that Jesus is still to this day walking the path of, of affliction as he cares for and sanctifies the church. So it's not like Jesus walked the path of suffering 2,000 years ago, put all that behind him, and now it's your turn to walk the path of affliction and suffering. No, that's not it, because afflictions for Christ still remain. He has not finished walking his path of affliction. 
And so when he comes alongside of you and he puts his arm around you and he says, let's walk together, he's saying we both have paths of affliction yet before us. Let's walk our paths of affliction in solidarity together. As he's bending down to pick up his cross, he's inviting you to bend down and pick up your cross. And trust me, his cross is much, much heavier than your cross. And his path of affliction is much, much harder than your path of affliction. But he does not leave us to walk our paths alone. And that truth lies at the heart of communion. Because in communion, we are entering into solidarity with Christ. We are partaking of both his suffering and his comfort. Paul says in verse 4, back in our text here in 2 Corinthians, he says that God comforts us in all of our affliction so that we can comfort others in their affliction with the same comfort that God has comforted us. And that's true just as much for us and Jesus as it is true for us with each other. Jesus was the first to walk the path of affliction. And as he walked his own shadowed valley, the father's comfort was with him. And God comforted him in his walking so that Christ could then take that comfort and extend it to us in our walking as we walk our paths through the shadowed valley so that we can then take that same comfort that comes from the God of all comfort that has come to us through Christ and we can extend that same comfort to others who are walking through their own shadowed valleys that Christ has comforted us with the comfort that comes from God. So be comforted this morning, knowing that you are not alone in affliction, that Christ is with you in your path of affliction, and that he comforts you in that path and is leading you out of the valley to the plains of grass and sunshine and beauty in his time and in his way, but that is what his heart most fundamentally is. Let's pray, and then we're going to turn towards the table. Father, thank you that you've given us Christ, and we would just, we would just never go into the shadowed valley if left to our own decision. But we thank you that Christ walked ahead of us, that he's been through the shadowed valley that he has come back to stand with us and to walk us through the shadowed valley. That even as he walks with us through the shadowed valley, he still bears the affliction of the people of God. Help us to trust him, Lord. Help us to trust you. Help us to experience your comfort in the midst of the shadowed valley, to recognize your goodness, and maybe we be filled with love for you, and find all that waits for us on the other side. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.